What do you make of the fact that we're not seeing a lot of movement here in crypto markets? It's, it's really trading along with, with traditional equities. You know, what does that have to say about the future of cryptocurrency? Well, it definitely ruptures one of the main narratives that people have been saying for many years, which is that Bitcoin is kind of this anti-correlated asset or, or uncorrelated asset to um, traditional equity markets. Um, we've seen that that's not the case. We've also seen some things that were, um, you know, unexpected, uh, especially with the beginning of the pandemic. I'm curious, Kathleen, what you think about the conversation around Bitcoin versus Ethereum as everybody waits for the merge and, and the idea of uh, proof of stake and what that might do to change how people interact with blockchain here. Yeah, so there's a lot of things in that question. Um, I mean, basically, uh, Bitcoin and Ethereum secure themselves through a mechanism called proof of work, um, which has come under scrutiny as the technology has gotten more popular because, in effect, what it does um, is it, it consumes energy in order to secure the blockchain. Um, proof of stake networks uh, do not do this. And, uh, you know, they've been looked at since uh, people have realized that Bitcoin is very um, energy consumptive as an alternative, um, but there isn't one that's as popular as Bitcoin or Ethereum. Um, Ethereum, of course, has been advertising itself as imminently transitioning to proof of stake uh, since 2014, but it has failed to do so uh, to date. So it's been a big debate, like, you know, basically, do you value this technology enough to um, uh, hold your nose and accept that it, um, I guess, consumes a lot of energy in most instances? Uh, or do you want to go to alternatives like Tezos, which don't use as uh, energy consumption. Yeah, and how do you think about that in terms of not just energy consumption, Kathleen, but in terms of transferring assets? There's been so much conversation this year about Lightning Network, for example, and the ability to facilitate payments over Bitcoin, but we've had a conversation internally. It's like you can do that more simply without another layer on Ethereum. So where does Tezos play into that conversation? Yeah, so I think Tezos um, addresses a problem that both Bitcoin and Ethereum have been um, unable to solve, which is it has a formal governance mechanism for ratifying and instantiating upgrades to the protocol. Uh, so this happens on the fly. It happens seamlessly. In fact, it's happened nine times uh, without any drama. Uh, uh, mostly uh, adding to the um, technological capability of the blockchain itself. Um, so I think, you know, basically for this stuff to scale effectively, you need to have a formal governance mechanism that actually instantiates upgrades in a meaningful fashion. Um, that's the way it would work if you, you know, were thinking about this happening, you know, at the order of, of millions or not billions of participants. Um, and I think Tezos is the only blockchain that really addresses this issue of stasis uh, in, in the code base. And so that's why I think it's, you know, obviously the future. Um, but uh, but it, Bitcoin and Ethereum to date have had uh, a lot of promising and a lot of under-delivering in terms of technical, um, technical, I guess, instantiations. And we've seen limitations of that over the last year or so uh, when Ethereum has fallen under scrutiny for having a uh, large ener energy consumption, but has still failed to upgrade itself uh, to the proof of stake version that it's been promising since 2014. Kathleen Tezos is second only to Ethereum and Twitter NFT discussions in the art world. And I'm curious what you think about uh, the prospect of Elon Musk owning Twitter. Um, I mean, it's certainly uh, pound for pound in terms of entertainment value has not disappointed, um, as is Elon's want. Um, I think, you know, basically Tezos right now feels like Greenwich Village in the 1960s. All the cool kids are hanging out there and minting a lot of art. Um, it's just a matter of time before people see it. Uh, and tw Twitter has been an excellent forum for discussion about this in, in the cryptocurrency space where, you know, basically the project gets a lot of airtime that it wouldn't otherwise because of these discussions in the forum that's created. Um, so I'm in for the Thunderdome, Elon Musk version of Twitter, uh, where <laughs> uh, allegedly censorship doesn't happen. I don't know. I don't know what his gripe is. Um, but it certainly has uh, it kept me on the site in terms of entertainment value and Matt Levine, uh, Matt Levine articles. So good. I mean, I wonder. Interesting. I wonder, go ahead, go ahead, Shanali. Yeah, sorry. I wonder also, you know, what is the future of communicating about crypto? Is it some Twitter Discord mashup here? I mean, ultimately, there, there seems to be some need or want for a more social communication aspect to, to cryptocurrencies above and beyond just payments. Yeah, I think um, I think a lot of these projects that are trying to do social alternatives on a blockchain or something like that have been um, mostly reactions from right wing people who have been largely banned on Twitter. Um, and, you know, the, the problem with that is that they often say very odious things. So I do think there's like a sort of uncensored version of the web that is very promising. I do think that um, once it stops being championed by repugnant people uh, that most of the place society doesn't really quite like, um, you know, it'll it'll actually take off.